Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Brittany Rickard. I'm the general manager of the Ketchikan Radio Center, um, KFMJ, KGTW, and KTKN. Uh, Michelle O'Brien can't be here today. She is in the Alaska State Chamber Conference in Fairbanks. Um, so we're going to go ahead and start with the pledge, if everybody would stand. and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we're going to start with a couple chamber announcements that Michelle was kind enough to leave me. I've got like six pages here. <laughs> um, don't forget that applications for serving on the chamber board are available. There are four seats open. Also, community award nominations are available on the same page at ketchikanchamber.com. And lastly, we want to welcome the new chamber member, Double Eagle Furnishings, um, to the chamber. I don't think I see Craig here, but welcome, Craig. Today, we have candidates running for borough assembly. There are two three-year seats available. We also welcome the mayoral candidates, for which there is obviously one seat available. And unfortunately, Glenn Thompson and Ian Michael Martin are unable to be here. They are both candidates for the borough, borough assembly, though. <clears throat> All of the questions have been submitted by community members. Each candidate will be given either two minutes or one minute and 30 seconds, depending upon the question. For the candidates, you will see our timer holding up a yellow card when you have used half of your time and a red card when you should conclude. And as a reminder for the radio listeners, please say your name before answering every single question um, because they can't see your faces. Lastly, we will have some quick hit questions mixed into the forum, and they really only demand a quick response, so um, just keep those short and sweet. Those won't, we won't tell you if there's two minutes or one minute, it'll just be a quick answer. And thank you to KPU TV and KTKN for airing this forum live. The Chamber appreciates their sponsors. It says to start at 12.15, and we're at 12.05, so there's a couple eating minutes in here. <laughs> Should we just go ahead and go? Okay, I'm like, we're streaming this. <laughs> All right. All right. So the following two minutes each. Thank you for your willingness to serve. Please tell us your name and one particular item about yourself that people more than likely are not aware of that lends to your ability to successfully serve. Um, I do have a written statement I'm going to start with, and when we do the questions, um, we will start this way, go down, and then the next question, we will start with the following person. You might be used to that by now. From Glenn Thompson. Hello, everyone. I wish I could be there with you in person today. However, I am currently unavailable on a trip that has been scheduled nearly a year in advance of my filing for assembly this year. I am running for a fifth non-consecutive term on the borough assembly because I feel like this is a consequential time for our community, and I hope to bring my varied skills and experience to the hardworking team at the borough. I've managed and owned many businesses over my nearly 40-year career. I know what it is like to be an entrepreneur in both times of prosperity and times of hardship. The same is true for my experience in public service. When I was first elected, to the assembly nearly 20 years ago, the borough wasn't in the best of shape. But what was true then is true now in both public and private sectors. Times of difficulty and hardship provide unique opportunities for unity and innovation. Our community is poised to reshape the uncertainty of the last couple of years into the foundation of a brighter future. We have seen just how resilient and innovative our community is. Promoting those ideals will carry us forward into a cooperative manner to make Ketchikan an even better place to live, a community that will thrive under any circumstances. Local government is effective and efficient when it is reflective of our community as a whole. We must be willing to consider every idea that is brought to the table, even if it isn't our own or is different than how we have always done things before. The best solutions are usually a combination of many ideas and centered in the middle. Local government exists to get things done. I'm running to help do just that. I would be honored to earn your vote on October 4th and once again serve you on the Borough Assembly. Thank you. From Glenn Thompson. We will begin with Austin Otis. This is two minutes. Hello, uh, I'm Austin Otis. I am born and raised here in Ketchikan. Uh, I'm finishing out my first term on the assembly. Um, I'm the young. I'm proud to be the youngest person on the assembly and the only millennial currently serving. Uh, 
I my background is in uh, nonprofit work where I work for Ketchikan Youth Court, which is a juvenile justice based program, and I work in hospitality industry slash tourism in uh, f working for the Inn at Creek Street as an innkeeper. So that's kind of my background. Um, there's really three reasons why I'm running. I really want to continue our focus on affordable housing. I think we've made some great, great strides in the past three years since I've been on the assembly. We were a little derailed from COVID. Um, I would characterize my term on the assembly as the COVID years because four months after getting elected, the pandemic happened. So we've had to focus all of our energy and everything on that particular issue. And we're just coming back into refocus um, on some of the issues that we were addressing. Um, I'd also like to have some input into some new parks plans that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, with the skate park roof and uh, with the baseball fields. And lastly, um, kind of addressing the elephant in the room is the LEF um, and s finding a, a, a solution for that um, deficit that we have there. So the LEF is the local education fund of people that don't know. So yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Josh Titus. Um, I uh, moved to Ketchikan 10 years ago uh, to, to uh, work as a nurse for Guardian Flight. Um, what I think um, equips me uh, to work on the assembly and, and represent Ketchikan well is, uh, like Austin, I'm, I'm relatively young. I've got three kids, um, and I work here in the community. And I feel, uh, in, and along with um, my uh, conservative um, mindset, um, I feel like uh, that that makes me able to represent a portion of the community that is underrepresented. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's what I want to do. Okay. Thank you. My name is Rodney Dial. I'm the current mayor of the Ketchikan Gateway Borough, uh, just finishing up my sixth year of service to the community. Something you might not know about me, I guess, uh, um, of course you do know my prior career with Alaska State Troopers, I spent about half of that in upper management. At one point, I was uh, assigned as the deputy commander of Sea Detachment, which is all of Western Alaska. I managed millions of dollars of resources, dozens of employees, troopers, dispatchers, facilities, cars, you name it. And then many years ago, I was actually transferred to Ketchikan to do the same thing. So I managed all patrol functions, essentially from Yakutat all the way to Matlakatla. We never had an unsolved murder. We never had uh, a budget that was not in balance. And I, I've uh, focused on bringing those skills over to the borough to try to do what I can, because I see us having some pretty big challenges ahead. Currently, we have a deficit in the local education fund of about $601,000. And as our finance slash uh, former finance director, currently uh, assistant manager would tell you, the gap to the cap, that point at which we are not supposed to go beyond uh, is about another 867000 So we have about $1.4 million um, that we need to kind of find a way to acquire here probably in the next year because we have teacher contracts coming up, we have uh, teacher health care liabilities, and of course we have the deficit. So we have some challenges. And I think that you know experience pays off in that regard and having the ability to go out and advocate because we really need to bring in extra money to this community. We cannot raise taxes enough to pay our bills by ourselves. Uh, if we were to cover a $1.48 million tax increase, you'd be looking at about a 20% property tax increase. So we need to really bring in outside money. And one of the things that I've been able to do Am I over or is that it? Wrap, wrap up? OK. So I would just say one of the things that I've been able to do is uh, get a, appointed to several national boards, Public Land Steering Committee and the Secure Rural, uh, uh, the Rural Action Caucus. And those will bring in a lot of money to catch camp. Thank you. All right. Hello. Uh, my name is Katie Parrott, and I'm running for uh, borough mayor. And um, I have uh, been coming to Ketchikan um, as a teenager. I have lived here for 20 years, most of my adult life. Um, and I live here with my husband, Jim. He's a charter captain in the community and a commercial diver. Um, and our three children, uh, my daughter, Grace, who just graduated from high school last year, and my son, Ruben, and then my younger son, Ian. Um, 
we are business owners in the community. Um, one thing that the community might not know is, uh, except some of the community members who were uh, my, my kids, uh, we used to be foster parents in the community. Um, I've worked in, uh, tribal, in the tribal government sector, in the public sector, and also in the private nonprofit. Um, I have a lot of experience coming from uh, those agencies in the community, from Community Connections, uh, Residential Youth Care, uh, Ketchikan Indian Community, and then my time with the school district. Uh, the reason that I'm running is because I was asked to, to have a different kind of choice of leadership and the kind of leadership that will bring the community together. Some of the issues we have at hand are our cost of living, housing availability and housing costs. Those are issues that are in front of the borough as well as education funding. And no one knows education funding and advocacy better than I do in this community. So thank you um, and I look forward to answering your questions. A lot of running going on. Um, this, <laughs> this is gonna be a two minute question as well. What is the single most important issue facing Ketchikan and how would you help to address it if elected beginning with Titus? So for me, that's uh, cost of living and our reliance on uh, on outside resources. Um, we need to, especially with um, with the rise of inflation, um, we need to keep the cost of living low uh, here in town. And, and what that looks like to me um, is developing resources here in town um, so we're rest less reliant on outside sources. Uh, we're surrounded by food and building materials, um, and yet we barge all that in. Um, so I would love to see uh, a way to um, get lumber from, from here in town, be able to certify that so it can be used on um, a permitted project. I'd love to see uh, more seafood available. I'd love to see more agriculture here in town. Um, so I think uh, I think that those are those are great things uh, for us to do. On top of that, we need to keep the cost of government low. We need to look uh, for an efficient government. We need um, we need to look for new solutions for funding, um, and not just uh, for increased taxpayer dollars. So I see the the most pressing issue for borough government is a balanced budget and addressing our current deficit in the local education fund. As I indicated, that deficit is 601000 That's as of today. The gap to the cap, another 867000 So if you look at teacher health care liability, if you look at teacher contracts coming up, if you look at the current deficit, we're going to have a need to bring in millions of dollars into this community in the next couple years. Um, education currently consumes $48 million of, of borough resources, or more than $3,700 per citizen. And that $48 million is made up of uh, several different types of funding sources. But the reality is, is that we're going to have to be very creative in bringing extra money into the community because trying to pass on that level of tax increase uh, to the public is it's just going to be damaging to our economy and to add that increase on top of inflation would be devastating to many families. So if we can, if we can get a balanced budget in order and if we can keep um, out of the pockets of the citizens as much as possible, that will support economic development, that will allow the borough uh, and, and our community to thrive and it will not compound inflation or the problems that we are seeing with housing. So uh, I want to get our borough uh, affairs better in order so that we can really start addressing those issues. Thank you. All right. Um, so um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, the three areas that uh, are, are so fundamentally important to encouraging economic development in the community and also encouraging people to come into our community and participate are cost of living, housing availability, housing cost. That Those are the top three for anyone considering staying in a community and relocating. So cost of living um, includes the cost of doing business. Our, our private businesses in the community are essentially the economic engine. We have to ensure that the cost of 
of doing business is is a good benefit to those businesses in the community. And I agree that we need to be mindful about the tax burden to our businesses as well. Um, uh, going along with that, one of the top issues is the local education fund uh, operating fund deficit. I believe a solution to that funding deficit is for the borough to allocate PILT funds, which are payment in lieu of taxes funds, to the LEF, which would solve that gap of around a million dollars moving forward. Then long term, the obligation for public education is a state funding obligation. And that's something that uh, we can assert a lot more uh, legislative advocacy in communicating with our, con our uh, legislators and really pushing forward um, the, the obligation is at the state level. It's in the Constitution that the state provides for that, and there's been seven years, eight years now of flat funding, which equates essentially to a funding cut to the community. So I think we need to advocate for uh, the, the, the burden of the state's uh, uh, budget cannot come down on the local community, um, and that's something that I will advocate for. I like standing, so I want to stand. Um, I think the Katie stole kind of my thunder, but um, so our our not greatest threat, but our greatest challenge, um, and it's not insurmountable, is housing, 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 housing. Without housing, you can't have economic development, you can't have thriving schools, and and etc. So, to me, the borough needs to address what we have, and I think that's the elephant in the room, and that's housing. We've taken some small steps. Um, we're in the planning stages right now of new subdivisions and um, expanding some service areas, putting in new roads and utilities. Uh, the federal government, uh, through the CARES Act, gave us about $7 million that we were able to put into a housing fund. I, in the future, I like to see this as a rotating fund uh, to put new uh, roads and, and utilities into subdivisions, but also selling some of our land and putting it back into the fund, kind of a revol revolving uh, loan fund in, in, that, in that aspect. We've also been working on things like um, increasing the, the density of, of property so we can have more lots on them. And we've also been looking into uh, maybe some kind of permitting process for Airbnbs. Not that we're thinking about limiting them, but in, in understanding that some of them don't pay sales tax while the other half um, get away with not paying sales tax or paying sales tax. So those are the kind of the, some of the things that are coming down the pipeline for the borough. And to uh, address the LEF, I do agree uh, the best option in front of the assembly currently is taking PILT, payment in lieu of taxes, which is money from the federal government that comes to the municipalities based on the land that they own around us and putting it into the LEF. Right now, I think that's the best option um, presented in front of us. So thank you. Okay, we are going to do a quick hit question right now. These are not time, but please keep it short and sweet. Name three local organizations or other things that you have been involved in, beginning with Rodney. Uh, so one that I've been involved in for years is FOAST, which is the Fraternal Order of Alaska State Troopers, and it provides um, uh, the concerts that you see in town, and we take and put all that money right back into the community. <laughs> Um, I've also been involved in the local NRA and uh, shooting sports in pr uh, promoting and protecting the Second Amendment rights. And I've been involved in several nonprofits on kind of a local level. For example, I've helped rendezvous with uh, building planter boxes for the seniors. I provide um, and build little things for different um, events to for charities like baskets and those kind of things. So I try to stay involved in the community. And then finally, on top of that, I, I donate 20% of my borough salary every month to charity. All right. Um, as I previously mentioned, uh, one of the things that me and my husband uh, did uh, years ago is uh, we were foster parents. Um, that's a huge need in our community, and it, it gives us a different perspective. Um, I've long been very active in youth serving organizations in the community, um, and part of the uh, resilience initiative uh, that kind of works toward uh, wellness initiatives uh, as a whole. Um, I'm also very active in my church. I'm the treasurer for the Ketchikan Nazarene. Uh, Nazarene and have been on the board, um, as well as serving in an advisory capacity for several nonprofits. Yeah, so um, 
I have uh, been pretty active in my in my church uh, in various churches that we've been to in the last uh, ten years. Um, at, just engaged uh, completely uh, with all their community events. Um, additionally, I've uh, volunteered my time uh, at the Ketchikan High School. I help out in the auto shop there uh, with uh, some of the the instruction for uh, diesel mechanics, and then um, just uh, various medical. Um, groups throughout the uh throughout the island um the health fair um just helping out with with that sort of stuff um and then i'm the the treasurer of our homeowners association so i don't know if that counts or not but uh it <laughs> it, it 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 definitely stretches my uh my brain so that's what i got uh thank you um so my background's in nonprofits, so I, I work for a nonprofit, so a lot of my background and what I do and volunteer is through nonprofits. Um, I currently play in the community, uh, Catch and Community Concert Band. The fun fact, I play drums, so um, that's a fun fact about me. Um, we're a small nonprofit. Uh, we do two or three uh, concerts a year. And I'm also uh, the elected the vice president of the Catch Can Wellness Coalition. Um, so I've been on that program for about three years now. And then I had had the great honor uh, to become the uh, first city Rotary president. And I appreciate that organization as, as a charitable uh, group that builds stuff in the community. So that's kind of my, um, my nonprofit background. The next question will be a th minute and 30 seconds each. Beginning with Katie, what attributes and behaviors are essential for borough assembly members? And how do you react if an issue passes that you do not agree with? Oh, I love that question. That's such a great question. Um, I think uh, above all, a borough assembly uh, member or a mayor needs to listen to the community, needs to listen to the constituents. Um, and not just the constituents that uh, line up with your opinion. It has to be a representation of the full community, and that's really important to me. Um, I think that uh, it, it, the way that representative democracy and governance works is that you make those decisions together and then the community moves forward. And there's a philosophy that um, I, I adhere to or I, I aspire to adhere to that's uh, around political friendship and that you develop relationships with people in a way that you can disagree, you can vote on the issue, and then you move forward together as a body after making a decision. And that you don't do the backbiting, you don't do the reflecting on, well, I wish this person would have done this. And, and, and that kind of dissension that really creates a rift. Um, everyone's elected to represent uh, their viewpoint but also you know, the members of the community who elected them. And that work has to be done together as a body. Um, and so I think respecting the process, um, the respecting the vote at the end of the day, even if you're in the minority, is so important. Um, and I, I feel like that's what I'll bring to the table. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so I think the really three main important things um, could you restate the question real quick? What attributes and behaviors are essential for borough assembly okay. members, and how do you react if an issue passes that you do not agree with? Okay, um, so really the three issues here. Um, I think being nonpartisan in your role is you represent so many different people in the community with so many different backgrounds. We're all at large members, um, so I think it's important. You can have your beliefs and values, but just understand that there's people that would disagree with you up there, so I think it's very important to put on a a certain uh, character when you're there to, to be representative of all the people in the community. Um, I also really like to establish friendships with other people on the assembly. I think it's important when you go out to lunch and coffee, it really breaks down some of the barriers or the political differences that you have. And um, last, lastly, when we bring certain uh, ordinance or legislation forward, it's important that you partner with certain assembly members when you have resolutions or things that you want to get done. Um, understanding the backgrounds of each assembly member I think is important and, and what attributes they can uh, contribute to what you want to pass. So that's what I'm the best answer I got. Yeah, so I think it's important that uh, an assembly member be a good listener. Um, I think it's important that they have an open mind and be able to um, be able to work with people to find solutions that maybe aren't exactly uh, what they wanted uh, on you know the top of all their lists, but but be able to work out um, a solution that, that works for everyone. Um, for 
uh, for Austin and uh, and Rodney, their their voting records out there. Um, I'm I'm new to this, and and Katie's new to this. For me, it's important uh, for people to know that there are certain things that uh, that I'm not comfortable. I have certain principles that I'm not comfortable violating. I've I've been pretty outright with my Christianity. Um, there's certain principles to, with Christianity, and they're right there in the Bible. If you want to know what I believe, um, that I'm just not willing to compromise with. I've also um, I've also stated that I'm a conservative, and that's a that's not partisan. That's a mindset. Um, it, it's uh, it's lower taxes, less spending, controlled, uh, controlled spending, um, less taxes. And so, so it's a mindset, it's not partisan. Um, and, and those are tools that I'll use uh, when I'm on the assembly, if I'm on the assembly. So for the radio, it's Rodney again. And attributes, uh, unfortunately, in, in modern day society, you have to have tough skin. Um, you also have to have the ability to listen, just like uh, Katie said. You need integrity. You need a consistency in leadership. Uh, you need the ability to dedicate the time to the job and position. You know, there may have been a time in our past when a ceremonial mayor was all we really needed as a community. But I would, I would respectfully say that to you that probably sometime after the cruise ship or the uh, pulp mill closed and we moved into the tourism economy, there are just so much so many different things that the mayor can be involved in on a daily basis to advocate for the community to bring money into the community and then um, unfortunately regarding you know that that we should all be non-political I would I would love to sign a document that could say that we could all be non-political but there are decisions that will come forward before the mayor and the assembly that are political if you say yes and if you say no and sometimes not making a choice is a choice. So it's, it's not that any of us want those um, political things to come before us, but it's just a sign of the time, unfortunately. And I think um, the best that you can do is try to just be consistent and fair and as neutral as possible as a local government to try to eliminate and reduce the division. I'm going to throw it right back to you, Rodney. Um, for a minute and 30 seconds, this is just a mayoral question. How do you see your role as mayor? So I see my role as mayor as the chief advocate for the community. Um, like I said, there's certain things that um, a mayor can do that the borough manager and staff cannot do. So for example, I've developed a relationship with the governor that's led to my appointment to three separate boards. Those are something that uh, borough staff couldn't do. Two of those boards required more than a year of work on my part. But the first two kept several state jobs in this community that were actually planned to be transferred out of this community. I'm currently on the third board as appointed by the governor, which is the 911 commission. I've been made chairman. Uh, the great thing about that is we get to put community projects into that report that will eventually go to the governor. These are all things that I couldn't accomplish if I had a day job. I also had over 200 COVID meetings during the pandemic. Could never have done that if I had a day job. So I see my role as to be out there on a daily basis talking to the developers and the contractors and the state officials and the congressional delegation and to work together to bring the money into this community that we need to thrive going forward. Thank you. Uh, this is Katie again for the radio. Um, so I, I have uh, spoken on this previously. Uh, the, the I see the role of mayor as what is outlined in borough code. And what is outlined as in borough code is as a, a ceremonial, nonpartisan facilitator of the borough's business. Uh, being able to lead the meetings, being able to preside over those actions, and to be able to operate within the form of government that's been established by borough code. And I will tell you that I'm extremely concerned about an approach that unilaterally decides on behalf of the community that we are going to uh, not operate under the strong manager role of government that we have. Um, to unilaterally decide that we're going to now operate under a, a strong mayor form of government, it goes outside of the process that's been established to make those decisions for our community. Um, I do believe that the role of mayor is, is very important to advocate for the community. Um, I am also on several boards relevant to one of the biggest issues that presents itself to our community 
to our community, which is education funding. I'm on the board of the Alaska Association of School Business Officials and on the education funding work group that is extremely um, active in legislative issues that come forward related to education funding. I intend to use uh, that experience um, to be able to benefit the community. And as far as uh, being able to operate in a way that gives a lot of time to the community, that is what I'm committing to when I ran for mayor. Um, I will commit all the time in the world to advocating for this community, and if we limit it to only people who can operate as a full-time employee of the borough, we are not operating in a representative democracy for our community. Thank you. For uh, one minute and 30 seconds, beginning with Austin, with the pressure of increased shipping, inflation, and supply chain issues, how do you think the borough could better support local businesses and encourage more people to shop locally? Well, I think the chamber does a good job of that with the uh, art walks that we do. We're going to have one here, I think, October 7th, or maybe, yeah, October 7th. Um, but I think that the borough can... Uh, can you, I'm sorry, can you restate the question one more time? Sorry. With the pressure of increased shipping, inflation, and supply chain issues, how do you think the borough could better support local businesses and encourage more people to shop locally? Yeah, so I kind of see this as kind of like an economic development question. Um, I know there's some uh, local companies that here that have sprung up uh, during the pandemic. We have some hydroponics, um, Ketchikan Evergreens and the Outpost. And I also see uh, Mariculture as being um, part of our community as well, even though a lot of the farms are happening on Prince of Wales. Um, pe people like Forge and Found uh, are started up here in the community. So it's about, it's, it's, it's a multi-pronged uh, issue that we need to keep lat taxes low in the community. That means utility rates. Um, these, thi these things make us competitive and have the advantage over other communities uh, in Southeast Alaska and in, and in the United States. So to me, the borough plays a role um, since we do have the economic development powers, uh, providing a, a, a stable economy, economy and bringing in federal dollars, like the money that we did, um, that we got from the Build Back Better program, a $49 million grant for mariculture in the area. So that's how I think that we can spur uh, economic development here in the communities. Thank you. So, like Austin said, I think it's multifaceted problem. Um, one way that one problem that I see is um, is coming out of the COVID years. Uh, there was so much money available to people, um, and uh, and and that has hurt our workforce. I see help wanted signs um, in all the windows. Um, and and so we need to find ways to get people to return to the workforce. Um, and, uh, and, and part of that might be ending some of these, um, some of these social programs um, and, uh, and, and getting people back to work. Um, and, then, uh, and then some of that is, uh, I lost my train of thought. Um, so, so ending, ending, ending some of the social programs, and then, um, and then we need to help people get back into the workforce um, through education um, and uh, and um, doing. Um, I'm try I've, I've lost the word. Uh, vocational uh, stuff in our schools, um, and so, so that would be one aspect that of uh, the problem that I think we could work on. Okay, so increased self-sufficiency, that was actually the theme of my speech to the Southeast Conference last week. And of course, you see this with the hydroponics, you see this with the fishing industry, you see this with uh, the people growing oysters, the mariculture. Um, you know, we also see this with food security. And so one of the things I've been doing with the governor over the last few months is working on a community emergency food supply, kind of like we used to have during the civil defense uh, years and that's to protect this community if we wind up having some kind of interruption with our barge service and if you've seen the recently uh, the recent release from the governor we're actually working in that direction so we're making progress on that of course uh, self-sufficiency through low-cost electricity I mean look at the transition to electric vehicles that's already taking place in our community now if we can provide that with low-cost hydropower look at the the uh, fuel that we're displacing and so the future is extremely bright in that region and there's so many things that we can be involved in but here's the thing you got to have the time 
to get, dedicate to this, and that means the mayor, right? The mayor has to be out there advocating for this. Thank you. All right, so uh, in terms of uh, cost of living, cost of doing business, the government does not have all the answers <laughs> on that one. However, the government can create an environment where economic development is, is uh, inspired, uh, can grow, um, and create uh, opportunities um, for new business and new kinds of economic growth and development. Um, but there are underlying issues that I think that we have to address. So in order to support a very healthy workforce in our community, we have to be able to work those mechanisms to providing a place for them to live. Um, and I think that that has been spoken of kind of ad nauseum in many of these um, these forums. Um, also, again, going back to uh, keeping the cost of doing business as low as possible in terms of the, the burden on the community um, and making sure that in those areas that are very important to advocate for, that we're advocating for in, uh, appropriately and effectively. Right, so uh, one of the things that um, I think is very important is making sure that there's plenty of, of uh, uh, land that's being uh, put into the hands of private owners to be able to develop and to put be put back on the market to make that work for the community, um, as well as ensuring that borough code is creating opportunity for um, uh, not suppressing new kinds of innovation in the community. I think that's really important to take a look at. Um, and so uh, last but not least, oh, I ran out of time. <laughs> Uh, we're doing pretty good, but a friendly reminder to please state your name before answering the question. Uh, people just tuning in probably don't know who's who. Um, beginning with Titus, as you uh, for a minute and 30 seconds, as you may be aware, many local businesses are struggling with hiring quality employees due to the lack of available housing. How do you plan on helping to address the issue of housing in Ketchikan? And can you provide any ideas on how Ketchikan can further expedite the construction of housing to make more available land to build those houses? Yeah, Josh Titus. Um, I'm uh, I'm not 100% sure what what powers or, or what what uh, resources I'm going to have available to me uh, on the borough. Um, but uh, but I think I would think that um, we turning loose uh, land, uh, developing plots, and 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 turning uh, that land out uh, for people to build on. Um, would be would would help that problem. Um, like I've said, I'd, uh, we're surrounded by building material. Um, if we can get uh, b building material uh, here uh, available um, and have it be cheaper than than uh, than what we're what's available to us now, I, I think that that would be helpful. Um, I think. Uh, let's see. Um, I think that's all I got. So the first thing we need to realize is that housing is a problem everywhere, not just here. Um, it seems like every time we take two steps forward, we take one step back. So we've got inflation issues, we've got supply chain issues, we've got the mortgage rates which are climbing. All of those things are working against us. The assembly has worked together uh, in the last several months to have staff pursue three projects, uh, one on the extreme north end, one near Lighthouse, the other uh, south of town. And what I've been able to do to help support that is I've ha I have a working relationship with the governor that I've developed over the last several years. Uh, met him here uh, recently. We actually talked about these issues. He's supportive of putting extra land in the hand of the borough that we need for road realignment projects, which will help us open up some of these, these areas. So we're, we're making progress. It's just slow, unfortunately. Yeah, so I, I think that some of the efforts my name, thank you, <laughs> uh, Katie Parrott. Uh, some of the work that the borough is doing currently, um, as has been mentioned, is extremely important. I think it's on the, the right track um, in terms of uh, opening up those new subdivisions, uh, the, the ones that are, are north and then south. Um, and um, I also think that uh, some of the work that's been done to take a look at some of the zoning and the land use, um, and then of course, as I had mentioned, opening up uh, some of that property to, to do some 
get some economic development going. So some of the development of the property, getting those into people's hands to be able to open up more opportunities for housing. Um, I think that we need to take a really careful look when there's uh, proposals that are put forward to the borough assembly about how that impacts uh, uh, other property owners as a whole. Um, I think that there's, uh, there's many community members who um, are looking at different kinds of developments, but I think that we need to make sure that those are all working together to actually increase the housing market and impact the housing market so that those things are going to go back onto the market to provide um, the support there. Um, and then I think that in general, we need to create a, a, the kind of community that people will really desire to come to, that they really see this place as a place that provides for multiple quality of life for their families, um, that not just it's affordable, but they have a good school uh, you know, to send their kids to, and that there's opportunities for them to, so that their family can thrive. Everybody took my answer again, but um, one thing that um, they they left out is um, I, th I see a lot of this as a workforce uh, development issue. Um, I know that the borough gives UAS a sixty thousand dollar grant to keep the testing center open, um, and that allows for people to get their certifications and other licenses to keep their professions going. So the borough does have an investment in workforce development, um, but to address the housing um, situation. Uh, I know the borough is looking at um, possibly uh, increasing the sales tax cap. If we create exemptions for construction materials, that will help out uh, business owners and developers in the community. And um, to to spur to spur uh, housing development, we are looking at really three main areas: Fawn Mountain, Mountain Point, and Mud Bite as the areas that we think are the best um, to provide more housing to the community. And it is about zoning, um, getting getting our properties right at Fawn Mountain and zoning them correctly so we can have duplexes and triplexes, the, the kinds of housing that is needed here for a healthy economy. So, thank you. Beginning with Rodney, a minute and 30 seconds. Would you be in favor or not of short-term rental licensing or, limit or limitation system in order to make more units available to local renters? Explain any solutions you might offer. Uh, so we know that's that's a problem, and not just here, but across the country, where people are turning their homes into Airbnbs and those type of things, and it's taking rental units off the market. And the reality is, is people can make more money and and have less hassles, and that's kind of why they're going in that direction. Um, you know, that's a real hard question for me to answer because I really like to put a lot of research into these type of things and get all the different user groups involved before I really make a public statement on that. So I guess what I can commit to is that going forward, uh, it's definitely worthy of discussion, but I really want to focus my efforts on bringing new housing online to, and maintaining people's ability and freedom to do what they want with their property. So I, I think that really needs to be our main focus. There's a lot of grant money rolling around out there. We're going to get our hands on some of it. And at some point, we're going to pull the trigger and just build a road or two if we need to, if we can't get these grants. And we're going to take things into our own hands. Thank you. Katie Parrott. Um, I, I would also uh, be in favor of taking a look at the impact um, on our community members because I know that um, property owners that are doing the vacation rentals, that's a really important part of their um, their income. Um, and so I would want to take a look at what the impact is, um, how many units we're talking about, and what would be the, the total cost to uh, families under those circumstances. Uh, I, would, uh, I would be open to that for sure, um, especially because of how it impacts the market as a whole. Um, and it's very clear that in order to have a thriving community, we need to make sure that there's housing availability for people who, who want to live here and move here. Um, I think that uh, one of the, a couple of the ideas that we have is there's varying levels that you can apply that kind of a, of a, a tax, if you want to call it that, um, and be able to do some exemptions under certain things. Um, but then also I think that it's, it's also important for us to allow our community members and property owners to have decision making over their property. Um, and some of the property owners that I know right now, myself and my husband included, are developing um, our properties in order to assist the housing market so um, and, and make that available for long-term rental so um, uh, that would be my answer uh, 
Um, yeah, I'm not in support of uh, placing limits on short-term rentals. I, I think there's less aggressive ways that we can do to tackle housing. Um, I, I am in favor of creating some kind of permitting process um, only to um, get the collection of sales tax. About half, there was a great presentation presented to us by the finance department. Um, about half of the vacation rentals are not uh, registered for sales tax. So half of them are paying and the other half are not. So to me, a permitting process would make sense to we get those required local taxes um, to the borough. So that's where I kind of stand with that. Thank you. Could you run through the question again? Licensing, maybe, um, but, uh, but regulation no people need to be able to do uh with their property uh what they want uh within within reason um one thing that uh th oh, i just lost my train of thought again <laughs> one thing that um that might help uh with the long-term rental um problem is dr what's driving people away from long-term rentals is I, I have an apartment under my house. It was there when I bought my house um, and, and it's stayed full and we've had uh, great renters, but I've heard real nightmare stories about uh, renters moving in and, and, and just uh, being really hard on the place. And when they're in there for a long time and you may not have visibility on it, um, that that's nerve wracking to me. And that's the one thing that's made me think about going to a short-term rental. Um, it, maybe if we found a way to uh, empower uh, landlords um, to to deal with uh, a bad long-term renter, um, that might bring more people uh, into the long-term rental market. And just going back to the the previous question uh, about um, housing costs, uh, one thing I missed would uh, if if property taxes go way high, that's just added expense for housing. So. Um, keeping property taxes low is going to be critical. We have a fun little quick hit here. This is not time. Please keep it short and sweet. Beginning with Katie, what is the most interesting and unusual thing you've done in your life that people might not be aware of? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, dear. Um during uh, oh, during a stint uh, when I was kind of wandering, I had I had come up to Alaska and then I had gone back down to the lower 48. I may have uh, worked for a short period of time as a bouncer <laughs> at a nightclub. And the, the the way that I find that this is relevant is I actually have really thick skin. You have to have re you have to be tough to be able to do a job like that. So there it is. Interesting thing. Um, I think it's my love for music. I currently am taking piano lessons. Um, I just started those about five months ago uh, with Austin Hayes, great musician in, in town. If you've never heard of him, um, and I've I've been playing drums for about twelve years now, or actually longer than that, probably fifteen. I started in seventh grade, um, and I'm twenty eight. So you do the math. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so music is my passion. That's one of the outlets that I relieve a lot of my stress um, as I go to KCCB and I play piano. So, and I'm currently gonna buy piano soon. So um, that's how I decompress from my busy life. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of wild, but as wild as you can be with three kids and a wife and a home and, and a full-time <laughs> job. Um, I, <laughs> when I was young, I was always putting stuff together, uh, just doing really dumb things like uh, scuba diving back into a cave with a fire extinguisher that I filled up with an air compressor. Uh, and and now, now I went and got my pilot's license and now I want to fly all th sorts of things that probably shouldn't fly. And, uh, and I'm constantly uh, driving these old broken down uh, uh, trucks around as I get them fixed up. So yeah, I just uh, as, as wild as you can be with, uh, with a wife and kids. <laughs> So one thing about being a trooper is you get to have some interesting stories. So when I was post commander at Glen Allen Post, I was working during the summer and see some people came in. They were hiking on a glacier and they saw an arm sticking out of the glacier. So it was it was up really high. We had to take a special helicopter to get up there. But long story short, turned out to be an old crash from the 1950s of some merchant mariners. 
And we were able to not only recover the arm, but actually get fingerprints off of it and find a ring that was in the ice near it. So um, yeah, over the years, I've had a lot of really cool stories like that, and that was definitely one of them. The next five questions will be area-wide issues, a minute and 30 seconds each. Beginning with Austin, the Ketchikan Gateway Borough Assembly voted unanimously to postpone consideration of an ordinance to increase the sales tax cap from 2000 to 12000 until the Assembly's second meeting in October on October 17th. Are you in favor of this, and why? Please explain. Um, Yes, I am in favor of increasing the sales tax cap, probably to the inflation adjusted number, about 4000 I think 10000 in one year is too much for a business and to the community to adjust to. Um, I did not agree with us postponing it. I thought that was kind of kicking the can down the road. I've been very vocal about that. And um, it kind of puts, put, puts us in a lame duck session where we're not doing anything for the next three meetings. So I was unhappy that we postponed it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do favor it. I think this plan that we have of transferring the PILT from the general fund into the LEF only works if we find back revenue to put back in the general fund. So to me, increasing the PILT to about 4,000, um, I think is a more comfortable number for uh, a business to be able to uh, accommodate for. So thank you. Well, my definite answer is I don't know. Um, in general, um, I would say that, uh, that raising the tax cap uh, would be a bad thing. I see that as an increase in, in taxes. Um, if we can find ways to come up with the money um, outside of raising taxes, I'm all for that. And and we're talking about a deep dive. I think every every uh, deficit that we have is an op is an uh, is a an opportunity to go back and look at uh, look at everything and see where we can make cuts, where we can be more efficient. Um, so I think in general, raising taxes is a bad thing. But if we've got to um, that might be a good way to do it. Um, it would just have to, I just need to have all the information. Uh, this is Rodney. Uh, so I was in favor of postponing, and I'll tell you why. The soonest that cap could have been implemented was April anyway, so we have time to, to look into this matter further. We also don't know the effects yet of raising the cap back in 2018. Um, Austin is correct. The the PILT idea of taking the PILT and putting it in the local education fund, really that's just moving pots of money around. So you have to find a way to backfill that. The assembly may ultimately decide that uh, raising the cap is the right idea, but you need to remember that if that's not implemented until April, we're really not even gonna start seeing revenue until late next year. We really don't know how much. The transfer of the PILT would be more of an immediate thing. And even transferring over the PILT into the local education fund, assuming that we get to the cap next year, which is highly likely, we would still have a deficit of around $200,000 that we would need to address. So I think we need to, uh, we need to do some more research in this, and we do have time. Uh, we need to involve the uh, business community specifically. And then um, you know, we've got until April of next year to make this decision. Thank you. Um, I believe I would support a moderate increase, um, but given that uh, every, I guess, every month that something is postponed is a month that it's not implemented, that that's potentially lost revenue. Um, so uh, I, I do have a question about that. Um, I think that uh, we do always have to keep in mind, though, I think it's an important point, ha what the impact is. What, what is the impact? And was there any depressed um, economic activity that we saw as a result of the previous actions? And so one of the things that I feel very strongly about is uh, data-driven decision making and making sure that when some of the changes are put forward, being able to have the information to evaluate what the impact was previously. Um, I think that there is some, there's some, been some great uh, progress that the borough has made in uh, in diversifying revenue and ensuring that you know revenue is coming in to support uh, public services and programming. Um, and so I would uh, definitely also look to uh, borough administration and the uh, sitting borough assembly members for feedback on how to formulate those uh, those opinions. Um, just because they're the experts experts, um, and they've been doing this work for longer than I have been involved in this work. Um, so that would be my response.
we just touched on this a little bit, so if you already did, feel free to elaborate. Would you be in favor of dedicating PILT funds to local education? Why or why not for a minute and 30 seconds, beginning with Titus? Yeah, so I don't really, I don't understand all of that um, quite yet, how, how PILT works. Um, it, it sounds like, um, it sounds like we, we could use PILT for other things. Um, or we could apply it to the education fund. Um, like I said, I don't know 100% how that how that funding all works. Um, like I said in the last question, um, it uh, any chance or any any um, any deficit that we have is an opportunity to go back and look at everything that we've got going. We we may be able to make things more efficient. Uh, we may be able uh, to find ways to fund this. Um, that doesn't require us um, using uh, using funds that would be available for for other things. So again, my definite answer is uh, I don't know. Me. Uh, th this is Rodney. Uh, so th here a couple months ago, we tried to address this deficit that we've been dealing with since 2018, and no one has worked harder on trying to get this deficit addressed than I have, and I think I do get to say that because right after the last teacher contracts and we had the deficit, um, I brought forward to the assembly a whole laundry list of potential things that we could do to address it, from car rental taxes, flight scene taxes, transient occupancy taxes, you name it. Um, I also came up with the idea to dedicate 100 percent of tobacco tax revenue to the local education fund, which did take off about $200,000. The issue that I have, though, is we want to address this problem without making housing more expensive. Now, if we just move PILT from one fund to another, we're just moving pots of money around. So I'd really like to look at um, how we're going to bring in the revenue first before we start moving the money around. This is Katie. Again, uh, I already spoke about this, so I think you know how I feel about it. I do uh, support moving PILT funds into the LEF. It's an allowable use of those funds. Um, I do understand that backfilling, backfilling the revenue is really important. Um, and I, I guess uh, one of the other things that I would uh, reiterate is the importance of state funding to education, to K-12 education. It is a constitutional obligation of the state of Alaska to provide for our public education system. Um, and my question to my opponent on that note would be, why hasn't he advocated more strongly to the governor, who he has a very good relationship with, for a, a solution to state funding of education? If that is the number one issue in front of the borough assembly, and we don't want that burden to come back on our residents, why hasn't that been more of a priority? And I will tell you that for my perspective as mayor, that will be my number one priority. Thank you. If you haven't already known, I do support PILT going into the LEF. Um, we did address uh, about half of the deficit last year. Um, we cut about $150,000 uh, to the school district and increased property tax by 0.3 mills, I believe. So that brought the deficit in about half, and I think that was a good um, compromise amongst the assembly members uh, to address the deficit. Um, but I also think that, yes, PILT um, going into the uh, LEF will help stabilize it into the future. Um, and Katie is exactly right about um, pressuring our legislature and the governor into increasing the base student allocation um, per student uh, so that we can have a flexibility on the local level to do other things with our dollars. So, thank you. A minute and 30 second, beginning with Rodney. For many years, the borough has granted local nonprofit funds, nonprofits, funds to serve our community. Please explain if you would be in favor or not of changing this process and how you would do it. Uh, so years ago, um, Ms. Pierce, who's in the audience, and myself, and once again, this is Rodney, we got together with the assistant manager at the time, and we created the new grant process to give local nonprofits a say and a voice in where that grant money goes. Um, I, I've supported that over the years. In fact, there's only been one case where I've uh, disagreed with, with that, and it was more from a... Um, 
uh, a money allocation standpoint that we had better things to spend our money on. Um, so, and I would like to, to go back to uh, Katie's thing about I should advocate to the governor for increased education spending. Not only have I, but we've seen that the governor has actually back paid all of the school bond debt reimbursement. And let's be completely honest here, between Katie and I, there's only one of us that's going to be able to participate in education meetings in the borough assembly because one of us has a conflict of interest. And that's not just me saying that, that's from a legal review that was conducted by CSG Law Group out of Fairbanks that says you have a conflict of interest and you're going to have to recuse yourself and you, and you will have divided loyalty issues and other concerns. So that's my answer. Uh, so back to the question. This is Katie. Um, the the nonprofits are so vital to the community, and the way that I see it, the the role of nonprofits is really in partnership with uh, governmental services, public services, and the economic engine, which is private business. And nonprofits really work to alleviate some of the pressures that impact uh, economic development, ec impact business, and also that kind of fall within the the gaps of public services. And so I wholeheartedly support uh, continuing the grants process um, and to allowing that process to um, allocate funds uh, to very, very important uh, service agencies in our community. And I think one of the things that uh, I'll address that has been brought up is uh, my conflict of interest. Based on borough code, there is nothing that prohibits me from serving as mayor. And actually, Borough Code does have a provision, it's 010508B, <laughs> um, that no district employee will be denied the ability, the right to serve as an elected municipal official. That's in Borough Code. Um, in terms of what I've spoken to in the past is I have one master. That is the citizens of Ketchikan. The school district and all of the business that's aligned with that impacts this community, and I can serve in that role and advocate for both. Thank you. Uh, thank you. As a nonprofit, I do apply for a borough grant that helps pay for um, my rent uh, for, for our space. Um, I do c want to, to continue uh, having the process um, basically be the same. There's some, s some tweaks from an applicant standpoint. Um, there's a scoring matrix that, that we get back with our applicant, well, that we were supposed to get back with our application, but um, we currently don't. So I would like to um, tweak that a little bit so that we can have better applications in the going into the future. Um, there is, I think we're going to have a working group um, if reelected uh, in the next few months on this that we're going to invite people from the nonprofit community uh, to come and give us a better idea how to make the uh, process more transparent and better for the applicant. And I, I would just really like to say that I, I trust the people on the grants committee making those decisions. We appoint them to those positions. They should be trusted in the work that they do, and we should keep politics out of the nonprofit uh, process. So thank you. So the grants process seems to be working for me. Um, obviously, the the uh, the borough assembly has review of that, and I think that that's a, a vital process. We need to make sure that there's uh, representation um, from the from the voters um, in the in in who gets a grant and who doesn't. Uh, that's Josh Titus for the radio. For a minute and thirty seconds, beginning with Katie. Development of Gravina Island has been a long time coming and not without expensive and animated discussions. Do you support further development and how do you envision or not Gravina Island becoming another neighborhood development within the borough? What are your ideas on the future of Gravina Island? Goodness gracious. This is Katie. That's a trick question. <laughs> Um, I do support uh, the development of Gra Gravina in terms of any kind of expansion and development I think is going to be good for the community. Um, so bringing on land that can be used, whether that's for 
um, other neighborhoods, subdivisions, or uh, business uh, activity is, I think, a good thing. Um, I think the costs and who bears the costs of that is something that uh, needs to be very uh, carefully considered. Um, I think that uh, there's lots of opportunity there, but Again, I would want to hear from uh, the, the subject matter experts on what can be done, what should be done, what would be the most uh, economically beneficial to the community. Um, I think the last thing that we want is to uh, funnel public funds uh, or public um, time and resource into something that ultimately is not going to bear fruit for the community. Um, so I think that it needs to be really carefully considered um, in terms of what is going to be the cost benefit of those projects. And if the cost benefit is not high enough um, that it's going to produce the result we want, then I would hesitate to move forward with directing any time and resource to those kinds of projects. Thank you. Uh, this is Austin for the radio. Um, I know Trevor back there probably wants to build a bridge, but uh, <laughs> um, but I've actually had conversations with Assembly Member uh, Pierce about this. Um, it's about access, really. So some things that we could work on is creating a service area over there and having the property owners over there pay into some kind of fee so that they can have better access through the ferry. That be, could be a, a simple uh, permit or a day pass. Um, or another idea that's been thrown out there is a, uh, a public marina being built over there just to increase access. Um, we know that the bridge is probably not going to happen, unfortunately. Um, and we're stuck with ferries, so, and the borough owns a ferry, so there is a lot that we can do to help develop Gravina um, in the long term. I can definitely see a service area being built over there and structuring it in such a way that they can better use uh, the ferry to get to their property. So, thank you. Josh Titus. Um, so access is, I think, the biggest issue. Um, and and increasing access over there helps us in a lot of ways. Um, it gives us more land uh, to build on. Um, and it also uh, gives us better access to, uh, to our airport. And through that, uh, we may increase our, uh, our tourism um, if we get additional flights in here. Um, I don't know if that's an option. Um, but, uh, but having more land over there uh, is just going to help us all around. Um, and we need to find a responsible way of, of, of funding that. Um, and uh, on, top of, uh, on top of all that, um, People that live over there uh, enjoy their space. I think that's the reason that they live over there. And so we need to be mindful um, that uh, not everyone wants to be packed in. In fact, I think most of us don't want to be packed in. So we need to pay attention to the density over there. Um, light pollution's an issue. We're all looking at that island. Um, so I don't know that we want it glowing. So just things to think about um, as, as we do that, I think it would be great for our community to be able to develop Gravina. Uh, thank you. So there's actually nothing here that I would disagree with. We do have a de development plan over there and are pursuing it. And there are developers that have recently purchased some land over there in trust, and they're al also moving forward with that. But to address a uh, something that has been brought up, I need to clarify. This report from CSG Law Group, and it says, and I'm quoting, significantly, however, while this ordinance allows the election to a municipal post, it does not eliminate the underlying legitimate concerns of the incompatible office rule, including the high likelihood that both conflict of interest and divided loyalty issues will arise between the two positions. And so when my opponent says there's no conflicts, you need to understand she's talking about no conflicts with running. She will have to give an ethics disclosure every time an education issue comes up, and there will be meetings that she will not be able to participate in. And so you're not going to be as effective as you think you are with education, respectfully. OK, beginning with Austin, a minute and 30 seconds, kind of a hot button topic. If you were to vote on Proposition 2 today, what would you vote for, yes or no? And please explain your reasoning. Uh, thank you. This is Austin. Um, as a borough resident living outside the city, I will be voting on this. And I'll be voting no. Um, my answer is pretty straightforward, just because we don't use or like 
uh, a specific municipal service, that doesn't mean that we should abolish or defund it. Uh, there's plenty of services that I don't use, like the bus system, uh, some people that don't use the swimming pool, but that doesn't mean that we should limit the bus system or that we should repeal the half-cent sales tax that goes to the rec center. So that is kind of my um, opinion on this. I hate how this has become part of this election cycle. There's so many other issues that we could be addressing, um, and this one has been extremely politicized, so I will be voting no on that, so thank you. Josh Titus for the radio. Um, I live outside and I'll be voting yes. My reasoning uh, is that 40% uh, that, um, of the funding for the library comes from the borough, um, borough residents, and um, they don't really have a say in what's presented at the library. Um, so I think it's, I think it's critical that, that everyone has a say. Um, that there, there were some, there was some, some partisan thought that went into um, presenting Drag Queen Story Hour at the library, and that's ultimately what Prop 2 was put in place for. Um, and, and so um, we need, uh, the borough residents need a seat at the table um, to, uh, to help make decisions about, about what's happening at the library. Um, and I think that Prop 2 um, get, is the beginning of that, that conversation. Uh, this is Rodney. I got a little different take on it. Because this is a citizen's initiative and I'm currently an elected official, I personally feel it's not appropriate for me to take a position on this. Because no matter what I would say, it would be seen as many as trying to influence the outcome. So you need to keep in mind that a citizen's initiative is the final recourse for the public when they feel their government is not listening to them. This is the time they speak and we listen. And I like to use this analogy because when I was a cop, if a police officer stopped somebody for a traffic offense and the officer and the individual couldn't agree on it, and that person decided to take it to court, I would have a real problem if my officer was then trying to call that person up and change their mind prior to the court appearance. And I would argue that most people would feel that's not appropriate. And for me, commenting on this is not appropriate. I can say that during my time as mayor, I've supported full funding of the library. I can also say that staff has indicated that if this initiative were to pass, there's other methods they could use to fund the library. So the manager is not taking a position on this, the clerk didn't take a position on this, the city council didn't take a position on this, and I'm not gonna take a position on this because it's time that we listen to the, what the voters have to say and then figure out what we're gonna do. Thank you. This is Katie. Um, I am going to take a position on this because I think it goes to the well-being of the community. Um, I will be voting no on Prop 2, um, and I think, um, because of the outsized impact on the library. The library and the library system for this community is so vital and it, it extends past um, just having a physical building that's in operation to check out books. Um, the, the library supports uh, every single school district or every single school in the district. Um, and I, I believe that there's a big difference between wanting a, a higher level of representation and 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 essentially gutting the operating fund of of the library that would result in lost jobs uh, lost availability to what I view as a very critical service I just the cost benefit analysis to me doesn't pan out um, I also think that it's worth noting that the you know kind of the controversy that started this um, the the drag queen story hour was the w most well attended story hour that the library to my understanding has had and so you it's again you have a, a segment of the community that you may not agree with but it's a constituency that access to public service and I don't believe that defunding the library for that hour and a half is worth it to the community. We will keep a normal rotation for this for the sake of simplicity. For two minutes each, we invite you to have a closing statement which clearly illustrates your goals as a candidate and what makes you different from the other candidates beginning with Austin. 
Thank you. This is Austin. Um, what separates me from the other candidates is I do have a nonprofit background, so I think that's probably why I'm such a zealous advocate for the community. I like going to the advocacy trips with Alaska Municipal League or Southeast Conference um, because in my organization, the Ketchikan Youth Court, we're always hunting for a dollar. We're always having to uh, scrape for, for dollars as anyone that's been a part of a nonprofit. So I think that's what separates me and makes me a good assembly member. Um, I love connecting with people in the region, um, and I love connecting with people in the community. So I'll continue to uh, keep serving on the assembly if reelected, and I'll keep doing what I um, have set up for myself. In, in nonprofit work, you often set goals for yourself for the year, and that's what I kind of do in my public office um, is I set goals for myself, certain resolutions, certain um, ordinances that I want to see passed. So um, I'd like to keep that high level of work ethic and and also some of these issues that are coming down the pipeline. I think we have a great assembly right now. We work very well together. Um, I think we're a good family, uh, and I think we'll be able to um, overcome these issues that are coming to us. So thank you. Joshua Titus. Um, so what I think sets me apart and makes me a good candidate for borough assembly um, is that uh, I feel like I represent uh, an underrepresented um, portion of the community. Um, and that's um, that's the the portion of the community that has a conservative mindset. If you look at uh, if you look at our our voting um, in in the last several elections, we we tend to go conservative, but we see that in uh, in city council and in the borough assembly, um, there's less conservative representation uh, in that assembly. We do have conservative representatives uh, in in both those um, committees. Um, but they're, I think they're underrepresented. So, um, and I, and the reason for that is, um, is I think we have a, a pretty silent majority. Uh, the the conservatives tend to be out working hard. Um, they're 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 constant. They're concentrating on their family, their community, and they don't uh, they don't go out for these positions. And so, um, I felt like it was important uh, for me uh, to to step up and represent that portion of the community. And uh, I guess I guess we'll uh, we'll find out on, on October fourth um, whether 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 I was close or not. Um, it might be a, a name recognition or I, I don't know. But uh, but I, that's why I'm running, and that's why I think uh, that's why I think I'll, I'll I'll represent this community well. Uh, it's Rodney. Thank you for being here today. Um, I do appreciate my opponent and the work she does for the school district. She's a good person, and I would never say otherwise. I think what this election boils down to is, do you want a full-time mayor, or do you want a, a mayor with a full-time job? Do you want a full-time advocate, somebody with time to invest in working with the borough staff, state and federal agencies, congressional delegations, state legislature and governor, industry, developers, someone available for various projects, or a ceremonial mayor? Do you want a mayor who's attended assembly meetings consistently for three years, or a mayor who, according to a recent legal review, will have a high likelihood of both conflict of interest and divided loyalty concerns, who will be unable to participate in many borough meetings, not because of a character issue, but because of what is called the incompatible office rule. It's the simultaneous holding of two competing roles in local government. It's going to cause a lot of drama for the borough, and it's going to diminish our checks and balances. Um, many of the things that I've mentioned here today are not tasks that the borough manager or staff can do. I can show you my involvement and how it's helped bring in millions to this community and help save millions. We have billions in state and federal funds flowing throughout the country right now. This community needs a mayor out there arguing for every last dollar, our share every day. And my point is, you can have a ceremonial mayor, but we will be missing out on a lot of opportunities. In my opinion, we outgrew a ceremonial mayor years ago, probably sometime after the pulp mill. So I ask that you judge me based upon my accomplishments. I'm more than willing to speak individually with anyone in this community and show you what I've done and how it's helped our economy and supported stable tax rates. So I appreciate your consideration. And if I've done right by you, I'd ask for your vote. Thank you. This is Katie. Um, I want to thank the chamber for hosting this and for having this opportunity for us to speak. Um, I think uh, I had planned a different kind of closing statement, but I feel compelled to respond to some of the uh, concerns that were brought up. Uh, my primary concern is being the kind of leader in this community that serves the, f the whole community and, and listens and represents 
in, in the tradition of the role that's outlined in borough code, and I, I want to reiterate that. It's not for one individual elected official to determine that the role needs to be different. That's a, been long established for this community, and it should go through a process if if there's going to be something different that's that's uh, put to the, to the people. Um, I want to mention that there's a reason why my opponent sought a private uh, legal opinion that he presumably paid for um, with regard to the conflict of interest. Um, and I also want to This is important enough to me that I am willing to make a change for this community if there's a per perceived conflict of interest. I have a legal opinion that says there is no legal conflict of interest. However, I understand that the public trust is of the utmost, and under the circumstances, I'm willing to make a change if that's what the community wants. I'm running because I was asked to run. I'm running because the people that asked me to run, I admire, I respect, um, and if they believe that I'm the kind of leadership that this community deserves to lead us into the future, then I'm willing to do it. Um, I will serve to the best of my ability. I, any, anyone who knows me and who's worked with me knows I give 110%. I give every drop, sometimes at the detriment of my personal life and my family. And that's what I'm willing to provide to Ketchikan. Thank you. Okay, well, thank everybody for coming out, and thank you to the candidates. That will conclude our forum today.